So this is from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So this isn't my theory. It's not my hypothesis. Uh, it's not uh, channeling from, from a higher being or the angelic realms. Look at what they say. Uh, the bottom line, we conclude that human chromosome 2 is the relic of an ancient DNA fusion of two ancestral ape chromosomes. Telomere to telomere. Telomeres are at the end of the DNA. You're probably hearing about those because of health and longevity. So if a telomere exists at the end of one chromosome and it's fused, you're going to be able to see where that fusion happens because the telomere is only supposed to be on the end of the chromosome. If it's in the middle, it means it was fused with something else, and that is exactly what happened. It says the fusion must have been followed by the elimination of overlapping functions as well as events that stabilize the fusion. So that's the technical language right there. What does it mean? Here's what it means. I want to show you a picture of it right here. Here, these are our nearest relative. Uh, right here, these are chimp chromosomes one and two. Somehow, these have been fused right there. And there's the fusion point right there. And this is where the telomeres are. They're in the middle instead of on the ends where they should be. This is human chromosome number two right here. It is the product of these two chromosomes coming together. Now, there are some people that say that means we came from apes. Not necessarily. It's like the best, most intelligent DNA available on Earth was taken and fused into a higher form of life, all right? And when it happened, some of the DNA was taken away, some of it was added, but here's the telltale sign. Here's, here's the thing. If you have two complete chromosomes and they are fused into one, can you see where the functions would be overlapping and redundant? So here's what happened. Once the fusion happened, the overlapping things were either cut away, they were taken away, or they were turned off to stabilize the fusion and make it very efficient. What scientists now say is the function, what resulted, so the, the cortex of the brain, the precision to be able to turn these things off and on, and the timing, the fact that it happened suddenly 200,000 years ago when we appeared suggests something beyond evolution, and here's where science opens the door to uncharted territory. Here's where science opens the door to forbidden language because what they are now saying is this fusion appears to be intentional. Who or what, we have no idea, but this is where science has arrived. They said this is not a natural process, could not have happened naturally, something intervened, and now the scientists say we have to stop there because we don't know what to say beyond that. So the question is, who or why did this? Every civilization, every society, every culture has their own answer. The ancient Babylonians, they had their answer. If you study Zechariah Sitchin's work, you know what that is. The aboriginals, I was just in, Af uh, in Australia. They've got their answer. They tell us. The Navajo of the American Desert Southwest, they have their story. The Egyptians have their story. The Hindus have their story. Christians have their story. The original Hebrew traditions have their story. The Navajo have their story. Scientists have had this story called evolution. There's a program on TV that has a very different idea. Okay, and now the DNA, this is forensic evidence. It means we're looking in the past at what already happened. Something happened. We appeared 200,000 years ago, and the honest truth is we don't know how this happened. If scientists can be honest, truthful, and factual and embrace that, then we can free ourselves from the dogma and the story that no longer fits and begin to find the answers. So as a geologist, I can tell you evolution. I've seen it in the fossil record for some forms of life, for some plants and animals. The data is breaking down when it comes to humans. And I have a lot of respect for Charles Darwin. Uh, he lived in a different world. It was a different time. And he was trying to get us out of the realm of religion to explain who we are. Where I, in my opinion, where Darwin went wrong 
was he took some observations that he made for some forms of life at one point on the planet in one moment in time and he tried to generalize them to include all life everywhere forever including humans and the data simply doesn't support that so that's all we can say is the data doesn't support it. Does that make sense? Are you good? Another piece of this that I can't even really get into today, I wrote a book in 2003, it was released in 04, called The God Code. What I did was I followed the instructions in a 3,000-year-old sacred text that had only been translated into English once. It's a Hebrew text called the Sefer Yitzhak, the Book of Creation. And it is as if someone were watching the moment that creation happened and recording it as a scribe, step by step. And it's, it's, it's language, it's words. I said, what would happen if I took those words and I converted the words into the periodic table of elements? So rather than taking fire and water and air and earth to make a human, what if we took, and there's, a, there's a, a logic to this, what if we took hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon? And I began working with it from this perspective. What if that text was actually telling us a chemical formula? And if that's true, it means that the DNA in our bodies can literally be read like the letters of a, of a page of a newspaper or a book. That there is a message in the DNA of all life. So I came from that perspective. Uh, I did the work. I did the mathematics. Uh, and there is a message in the DNA of all life. It's in layers. The very first layer, the very first message in your body, every cell in your body has the same message. And the, and the message, when it's translated, literally reads, the DNA literally reads, God eternal within the body. God eternal within the body. Now, why is that message in the human genome? I don't know. I just followed the instructions in a 3,000-year-old text to the T, and it's there. So someone figured out how to store data in DNA a long time ago. Now, immediately after I wrote that book, Japanese scientists came out with a report. They took bacteria and they began storing data in the, in the DNA of bacteria, and they stored an entire library a city block long inside of the bacteria, and they let the bacteria reproduce 2,500 generations, and then they pulled the data out intact. It says that we are just now learning to store information inside of living DNA if we're doing it now, it's possible that an advanced form of life has done that a long time ago. If we are the product of an intentional act, what better way to alert the beings that carry the message than to encode it within their very lives, within the DNA itself? Now that we have the technology, I get goosebumps just saying that, now that we have the technology, we can literally read a message. And think about this. When we create something today, if you create a piece of art and you're proud of it, what's the last thing you do with that piece of art? Or a sculpture. Or you create a piece of electronics. Every tiny piece of electronics has an identifying mark on it somewhere. If we are the product of an intentional creation, I would not be surprised that within us, is the mark of, of who or whatever is responsible in a way that would last as long as we do, that could not be destroyed like a temple wall or could not be destroyed like an old manual or a text. It lives in the life itself. God eternal within the body. What does that mean? Who is God? I don't know what that means, but it all comes back to what's happening right here. 200,000 years ago, we appeared on this earth. And we were given extraordinary abilities that no other form of life has. I don't think this is before religions. This isn't about religion. Religions came later, and they wrapped the rules and the dogma around a pre-existing truth. This is deep spirituality in that it is about us and our relationship to the earth, to the cosmos, to you and me, to one another, and, and to ourselves. So now we are evolving to the point 
maturing to the point where we can tap this extraordinary, extraordinary neural network. What do we make of that? What do we do? How do we apply that to become the best people we can be and create the best possible world? How do we do that? The very experience that was written out of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions, they were taken right out of the Bible, told us, forget about the feeling. And the feeling is where you have your power because you can intentionally create feeling and no other form of life can. Every other form of life waits for the world to give them a reason to feel so they can react. You have the capacity to create the feeling because you choose and that makes you a very, very powerful being. Believe it or not.